Hey guys, welcome or welcome back for our final chapter reading for this week. <sighs> it's getting good. It's getting really good. And if I'm honest, I'm cheating because y'all are seeing these a couple days apart. And <laughs> this is the third time this week I've come to you. But it's the same exact day, like moments apart from each other. So I apologize for cheating, but <laughs> I have to record the best way that I can get this content out, number one. And number two, it's so good that I don't want to put it down. So go ahead and do me a favor and hit the like button as we start chapter 17 in a memoir, Shattered Dreams. My Life as a Polygamous Wife by Irene Spencer. Verlin's mother, Maud, gave him her three small houses at the LeBaron's Ranch for an early inheritance. She was thrilled Verlin was so courageous and diligent in his pursuit of polygamy, and she was willing to wrinkle older brothers, Alma and Ervil, in order to demonstrate her approval. She also figured that since Verlin's family was growing so fast, we needed all the help we could get. Since the cold winter months were almost upon us, Verlin insisted on moving us immediately. Donna was only two weeks old. He had to get all three wives settled into their first house fast. We could keep warmer together. Using Charlotte's wood cooking stove for heat, the house only had two bedrooms, so I agreed with great reluctance that Lucy could share my bedroom, but only because I had Verlin's promise that I could live alone in the second house as soon as he could afford to fix it up. Now, girl, you didn't learn your lesson the last time you agreed to do something. You were supposed to have your room and she was never supposed to be in it to she was going to sleep in it on certain nights and all that other stuff. So you don't think he's going to find a way out of this, too? I guess we'll see. On one of our first days there, the wind blew so steadily and strong, the stovepipes flew off the house and across the yard. After it happened the second time, Verlin tied them to the corner of the roof with bailing wire. The storm raged on. During the night, I was huddled next to Lucy with little Donna tucked in between us. I had no crib, so I had to sleep lightly on the constant guard so I didn't roll over on her. That is so dangerous. And I'm someone who, when I'm in the bed, I don't move. I stay in one position on like one side of the bed or one little slot. And even I would have been too scared to do that. The wind moaned for hours, making sleep almost impossible. Earlier in the evening, I secured gunny sacks as tightly as I could over the window frames. We had no glass in the windows at all. The wind blew so violently, the bailing wire could not keep the metal stove pipes from coming loose and flying off the roof again. The gusts also loosened the sacks covering the window frames. The room was, was unbearably cold. I could hear the sacks flapping as they beat time in the wind. What? I got up and tried to light the coal oil lamp, but the matches blew out faster than I could strike them. These people don't even have windows. Winter's coming. There's a little baby that was just born. Another one's going to be born soon. And then another one after that. And y'all don't even have glass windows to be ready for the winter. The chill went through my whole body, causing my teeth to chatter uncontrollably. I slipped on my shoes and felt my way down the dark hall, gliding my hand along the cold wall until I felt Charlotte's bedroom door. Verlin, I called. Sorry I had to interrupt Charlotte's night. Please come and help me. I need you. Hurry. He jumped up and followed me back to my room in his pajamas. Boy, this weather is terrible, he explained. Get back into bed before you catch a cold. He felt for his coat in the hall. Taking a woven rug off the floor in the hall, he went out and nailed it onto the window frame next to our bed. He came back into our room, stomping his feet. When he finally got the coil, the coil and oil lamp lit, we were shocked to see the foot of the bed was covered with snow. 
He pulled the blanket off and shook the snow into the hall. Then he threw it back on our shivering bodies. I moved my 24 day old baby to the outside of the bed where I could hold up the edge of the heavy covers so she could breathe while we attempted to keep warm throughout the bitter cold night. Somehow, pregnant Lucy and I managed to drift off into a deep sleep. Incredibly, without Lucy or me knowing a thing about it, Charlotte quietly gave birth to her third child, Laura, sometime before daybreak. Following Charlotte's wishes, Verlin secretly sent for Lucy's mother, Sylvia, to attend the delivery. After Charlotte's participation in my baby's birth, I was shocked not to be included in this birth of hers. So was Lucy, but it was practice Charlotte would maintain throughout our lives together. She helped out with our stuff, but we were never included in the delivery of any of her nine children. Charlotte is a rare breed that is not going to have the same stuff that's going on with them, going with her. She doesn't need their help. She's a pro and she got this. Throughout December, the cold made it almost impossible to keep warm in our house. We wore thick sweaters day and night. I slept lightly, always worried Donna would freeze or smother under the, my covers. I longed to have a crib and other minimal comforts of life. Andrea came at Christmas time. Though she couldn't afford to do it, she was so shocked at our living conditions. She contributed $100 to buy windows for the house. Verlin quickly measured the frames and ordered the windows. When he went to pick them up, he ordered a table and six chairs for me on credit. I'll never forget those beautiful wood frame windows with real glass in them. What a joy it was to raise them up and down just to see how they worked. One thing led to another, and pretty soon Verlin was entirely carried away. He bought plaster for the living room wall so we have at least one nice room. Then he splurged and bought some bright rose-colored paint he applied to the walls himself. On the next trip to town, he brought back some loud pink flower drapery material for curtains. I didn't mind him exploring his artistic side, but after seeing how that colorful room turned out, I told him I thought his creativity should be restricted to creating babies. <laughs> it does seem like a lot of colors is going on there. When Aunt Rhea returned again in the summertime, she was thrilled to see the improvements we made on the house. She approved of the new windows and seemed to think things were progressing nicely. Verlin's ingenuity especially impressed her. He set up a metal tank on the roof of the house. He would carry three five-gallon buckets of water up a ladder and pour the water into the tank where the sun would warm it for our showers. Because the tank was small and a chore to fill, we were instructed to follow careful procedures whenever we used it. We were to get in the shower, wet ourselves down, turn the water off until we soaked up, and then rinse off. Aunt Rhea did exactly as instructed. She hollered out that the water was nice and warm. In fact, it felt wonderful. I heard her turn the water off to lather up just as she was supposed to. But a few seconds later, she was shouting in exasperation. Somebody help me. The water's all gone. I can't rinse off. I called Verlin, who rushed out and drew up water from the well, then climbed up the ladder and poured the five gallons of cold water into the tank. It's okay. You can shower now, he shouted. I'll never forget Aunt Rhea's screams as she jumped to one side when the cold water hit her and in an attempt to take the chill off, Verlin added a tea kettle of boiling water so she could finish her shower more comfortably. Even these little luxuries were short-lived. The original four-room house was far too crowded with Verlin, all three wives, four children, two of them small babies, and Lucy's baby on its way in April. So Verlin consented to let me move into the second unfinished house. He put glass in the windows, and I was elated as I cleaned the old place out. Donna and I would have three rooms all to ourselves. When my new table and chairs arrived, Verlin finished them beautifully with white paint. He, at, he had enough left over to paint a small rundown cupboard we inherited from his mother. With the addition of a few nails to strengthen it, the cupboard now looked shiny and new. 
I filled it with pots and pans Verlin's mother gave us permission to use. Next, Verlin cut the handle off an old broom and used bailing wire to hang it from the wood beams in the ceiling to serve as a closet for my meager wardrobe. I wasn't too happy with the stove he gave me because it smoked up the kitchen. It also had no oven, but I could walk 20 feet over to Charlotte's house and use her own her oven for baking. The inside walls of the house were plain, no plaster, no paint. I owned no pictures or knickknacks, not even a mirror or a clock. I had no kitchen sink or running water, but I would finally be alone and I'd be free. For the first time in two years of married life, I had my husband all to myself. Now I could hug him and say what I thought without fear of being overheard. No more whispering. I didn't have to be continually on guard. I could laugh and joke and be myself. But best of all, I wouldn't have to share my bed with any other wives. It's the little things that she's excited about. I spent five days in heaven. Then Verlin came in and told me he'd been thinking about things. I knew that meant trouble. It meant the other wives were voicing once and I was going to end up with less. It's not fair for you to live alone. Charlotte should have that privilege first. Didn't I tell y'all he was going to go back on it? Didn't I say that this man always goes back on what he says to her without fail? And here he, here he is going back on it. Hell, I interrupted. She lived alone with you for two years before I married you. I've never had any time alone. It's my turn. I don't know you yet. Oh, come on now. It's not right that six of us should be cramped into those tight quarters while it's just you and little Donna live here by yourselves. Besides, Lucy says she prefers living with you. I blew up. What more do you want? I was forced against my will to let Lucy marry you. Then you begged me to let you bring her home. You managed to get her in my bed. And now you want her to move in permanently to live with me for the rest of my life? I refuse, Verlin. Girl, what you refusing for? He's going to do what he wants anyway. She's going to end up with you. And Charlotte's going to have her own spot. She's not my wife, she's yours, so you figure it out. He couldn't help laughing at that, and he tried to tease me into laughing with him. You're the one who placed her hand in mine. Now she has the right to go where I go? Well, you can both go to hell, I shouted. Every decision you and I make revolves around another wife. Urging me to comply, he said, I could put more clay on the roof of that back storeroom, and Lucy could use it for her bedroom. How would that be? Just give me one room of my own. I'll be glad to get by in it if I can, if it means I could be alone. I'm sick and tired of all your damn promises. Irene, I can't afford to separate you right now. Please realize I'm doing the best I can. All three of you want your own home. Just don't be selfish. I knew what he was saying was true. I had to give in. But it seemed like every time I got my hands on something I dreamt of having, it was immediately snatched away. Charlotte and her three children stayed in the original house we all lived in together. And Lucy lived in, moved in with me into the house Verlin had promised that I could have to myself. Verlin shouldn't have made the promise if he knew he couldn't keep it. And he already knew that it was going to be a thing. But this is what Verlin does. Dr. Ramirez actually made it on time to Lucy's delivery. She went for four hours in hard labor while the four of us, Dr. Ramirez, Verlin, Charlotte, and me, attended her. When her baby finally arrived, Verlin was jubilant. It's a boy. Can you imagine that? God has given me another boy. Hearing him sound so proud and surprised, I suddenly fixated on the fact that God had not yet given Verlin that particular gift through me. Girl, the germ of a new fear and a new jealousy infected me. Meanwhile, Lucy and Verlin named their boy Chad. A few days later, at Lucy's insistence, Verlin cleaned up the third two-bedroom house that had been the old LeBaron two shed and Lucy moved in it. I was thrilled as she was. At long last, we all had our own places. We held a family council at which each wife gave her opinion about the fairest way for Verlin to distribute his time and attention among the three separate households. 
Charlotte, Lucy, and I were already on a continual rotation for sleeping with him. As for Mills, we decided he could eat two days a week with each wife. Then on Sundays, he'd eat breakfast with me, lunch with Charlotte, and supper with Lucy. <sighs> that just seems odd. Like, that, yeah, anyway. Division is created because they don't really, yeah. On Sunday, why don't y'all just all eat together? I don't know. Maybe, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I don't know. I had Verlin all to myself on Wednesdays and Saturdays. Those two days were mine and no one else's. When he went to the fields or took a real trip to town on one of my days, I could go with him. I would respect Charlotte's and Lucy's days with Verlin just as they would respect mine. It was exciting. I would often save my allotments of sugar and other supplies so I could make special meals for him when he came to my house. Soon, I noticed he ate like a king whenever he wanted. Always vying to be his favorite, we all sacrificed to treat him extra special. Now that I had my own house, Verlin couldn't understand why I still spent so many nights crying. I wanted to be strong and live up to his expectations, but jealousy drove me into tearful fits of anger. I'd cover my face with my pillow, sobbing and screaming as my mind flooded with images of him and Lucy breaking all the rules, manufacturing baby boy after baby boy, even if she was his wife and even if God had commanded us to live plural marriage. I still hated every minute of it. I spent almost the entire first year of Lucy's marriage weeping and imagining she'd taken my place in Verlin's heart. When I admitted to him how I continued to struggle with jealousy towards Lucy, he reprimanded me and prayed I would overcome such irrational and righteousness reactions. She's getting reprimanded like she's a child. She said the word reprimanded. He wanted his wives to be humble and submissive. Apparently, Lucy complied, but my cl compliance clearly was still not up to par. Once we wives spread out and came up with a Verlin rotation everyone agreed to honor, I did find life a little easier in certain ways. Finally, I had a few things I could count on. I could count on no one being in my bed whom I didn't want there. I could count on no one overhearing me when I voiced my thoughts or feelings aloud in my house. And I could count on enjoying Wednesdays and Saturdays all along with my husband. These meager little things were my lifeline. Late on one particular Wednesday afternoon, Verlin opened my screen door and said, Irene, do you want to go for a walk with me to the wheat fields? I sure do. I was I said excitedly. He hugged me and said, then wait a minute. I've got to go to the John. It'll give you time to get ready. This was perfect. My baby was sleeping, so I'd have a couple of free hours if Lucy would just peek in on her from a time or two. I rushed off to my bedroom where I brushed out my hair, put it in a ponytail, and slipped into a clean dress for our date. Almost the only place I ever got to go to was the Spencer's. I was thrilled that Verlin went to the trouble of thinking up something fun for us to do. Is this, is it really going to be something fun? I really felt privileged as I fantasized about how romantic it was going to be, just the two of us walking through the golden grain. When Verla didn't come back after several minutes, I started to wonder why he was taking so long. He said he'd only be a minute, so I decided to meet him outside, but he wasn't in the yard. So I walked past Lucy's house to the outhouse. He wasn't there either. I couldn't imagine where he'd gone. I opened Lucy's door and called. No one was there. How strange. I'd seen her haul a bucket of water from the well to her house just a few minutes earlier. Oh, Lord, this is not going to be good. It must have been instinct or perhaps just that irrational, unrighteous jealousy of mine. I gazed out over the yellow wheat field and saw something that extinguished my good mood and my newfound sense of security like a pail of ice cold water. There went Lucy and Verlin arm in arm like the proverbial lovers heading off into the sunset. I wish they changed course and head straight for hell. That proved it. Lucy was Verlin's favorite. Why did he tell her he was going to take her out? It's her day and he's on her day and he's with this. See, this is the stuff I'm talking about. It was my day. 
and he invited me, but he took her. If she was going to steal him away from me in broad daylight, she could just have him. But boy, would they both be sorry. I had to hurry up if I didn't want them to catch me. One by one, I carried three dresser drawers from my house over to hers. Two of them were full of Verlin socks, jeans, underclothes, and belts. The third contained all sorts of other things, including pens, pencils, erasers, writing books, and various important documents. I dumped all of it onto Lucy's bed and hurried back for Verlin's shirts, coats, and sweaters. Holding these by their hangers, I swung them high and landed them on top of his other stuff. Then I grabbed a wooden crate by Lucy's door, ran back to my house, and filled it with Verlin's shoes, slippers, and rubber watering boots. Sounds to me like Verlin got a whole bunch of stuff. Meanwhile, these ladies barely got anything. But let me continue. I piled three old caps and his straw hat on top and lugged the crate back over to Lucy's. Some things dribbled across the floor as I dumped the contents of the crate on her bed along with everything else. She knew darn well it wasn't her day. I ignored Verlin when he came in. I wasn't even going to look at him, but he pulled me around to face him and said, Irene, how can you be so mean? You got Lucy crying over there. You know she doesn't have room in her small house for all my things. I started to cry. Well, let her make room. If you're going to give her my time, I'll give you, I'll give her your other things too. She can keep, just keep them. In fact, she can keep you. I sobbed. Honey, don't be so mad. She followed me out to the john and asked what I was doing. You should have told her you were taking a dump, I interrupted. How could she be so stupid? He tried not to laugh. Really, honey, I told her I was going out to the wheat field and she begged to go with me. If I had refused her, she would have felt bad for a week. But I know you. You blow up and then it's all over in five minutes. I decided I'd rather have to... I'd rather deal with you and save myself from a week's worth of trouble. I'll take you next time, I promise. I know that you'll get over it faster than her. So I just decided to disappoint you. And it, see, the polygamy ain't made for me. Ain't no way. Ain't no way. That was Verlin all over. At least he always felt as comfortable telling me what he was really thinking. Selfish as it might be. As I felt telling him, still, I rejected his Uggs. He finally left because he could see I wasn't going to give in. All sorts of nasty thoughts ran through my mind about Lucy when I saw her a few minutes later at her kitchen door when she picked up the wooden crates, supposedly to start packing away some of Verlin's stuff. He tried to comfort her by giving her a big kiss. Boy, did the devil ever whip out his pitchfork and stab me when I saw that. I hollered out. How do you like kissing her big nose? Lucy went into the house crying and I backed off knowing I was in big trouble again. <laughs> Irene is spunky. I give it to her. The girl is spunky. Two nights later, as was his practice on the evenings he spent elsewhere, Roland came to tell me good night. It was his turn to sleep with Lucy. How I hated those damn turns. I wanted to sleep with Verlin when I wanted to, not just when it was my night. We were on the bed kissing, and my body forgot that it wasn't my night. It almost went wild. Verlin tried to leave, saying as he pulled away, I really love to stay here tonight, but I can't. You could if you really love me, I challenged. I do love you, but I got to do what's right. Do you think it would be fair if I stayed at Lucy's all the time? What would she think then? I tried pulling him back onto the bed. If you really love me, prove it. Okay, y'all, this is, it's a game with them. I do love you, but I can't ruin Lucy's night. I want you to stay here when I want you to. Besides, my body doesn't know a damn thing about turns. He left in a huff. He was tired of my ungodly innuendos. I knew I pushed him farther than I should have, but I just couldn't help it. Now I might as well push him a little farther. I peered out the window as soon as Verlin closed Lucy's old wooden door. I rushed outside and grabbed a rock as big as a grapefruit from the flower garden next to my house. Girl, don't do it. I ran halfway to Lucy's and heaved that rock for all it was worth against her kitchen door. I knew I should sk skedaddle then, but my anger made time for one more assault. 
I flung a second rock, good and hard, bouncing it off her door, and then I ran for dear life. Safe inside my own house, I locked the door behind me and fell across my bed in tears. This is too much. Irene, you can't do all of that, girl. I got mad at Lucy for taking your time. And here you are interrupting hers and doing all of that when he didn't even tell her that he was going to go there with you. But you over here throwing rocks and stuff at the door. Irene, you know the place is already falling apart. What if the rock busted through the door? <laughs> A minute or two later, Roland almost knocked my door in with his violent banging. Open this door, he ordered. I made no response. You'll be sorry, he threatened. I didn't answer. You've gone too far. I can't believe you treated Lucy like this. Open up. My heart was pounding so loud, I was afraid he could hear it. Other than that, I didn't make a peep. Okay, you'll be sorry. Still, I didn't budge. I listened until I heard Lucy's door open and close again. I would just have to make up with him the next day after he calmed down some it would be my turn to feed him anyway girl he not gonna come and see you he just told you you'll be sorry you didn't open the door you threw that big thing he already thought you were being ungodly and now here you are not listening to him he's not coming to see you but the next day verlin didn't come for breakfast like he was supposed to i watched him working in the fields at lunchtime i noticed that he ate at charlotte's he passed my place several times throughout the day, but he never stopped to see me. At dusk, he milked the cows. I knew he'd head over after that to tell Lucy the night before he went to spend the night with Charlotte. He had even told me he hadn't even told me good morning yet. I stood looking out my screen door, hoping that the next time he passed by, we could reconcile. After all, the Bible said, "Net lot, net lot." Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Girl, but you let it go down the previous night. I suffer enough that day. I didn't want to go on suffering the next day. I watched Verlin approaching. And when he didn't stop, I stepped out in front of him. Hey, can't you even say hello, I asked. Do you want me to? Seeing he was still mad, I didn't know if I wanted to or not. Suit yourself. But you can come in if you want to, I said. He followed me in, but he didn't touch me. I was actually relieved. Although he never more than raised his voice to scold me, I've been a little scared he might hit me on this particular occasion. You ruined Lucy's night. She feels terrible. Why would you ever treat her like that? I remained silent. I've got to put a stop to this kind of mischief, he said, reprimanding me more severely than usual you have to learn to respect lucy's rights i'm not sleeping with you for three of your nights they'll be given to lucy <laughs> y'all he's really treating her like a child not i'm asleep on the couch not none of that stuff i'm gonna give three nights to her Did, I, I couldn't do it I don't agree with what she did, but mm -mm. he pulled out the big stick, the last resort for polygamous husbands, desperate to keep their plural rise in check. That's not fair, I shouted. That's nine nights. I only threw two rocks. I don't care. I already told Lucy and that's how it's going to be. And off he went. Verlin was sincerely shocked and disappointed that a girl like me who'd been raised in a staunch fourth generation polygamous family would behave in a manner so counter to the whole way of life. I was too angry to bother about such expectations. I started thinking Charlotte might wish I would throw a few rocks at her house so she could get some extra nights too. Other devilish thoughts crowded out my higher reasoning as I screamed and kicked the bed. Maybe I shouldn't have done what I did. That was true. But if I ever did it again, I'd be sure to do it better. I'd rock that Lucy right to sleep forever. One day between the rock throwing incident and the birth of my third child, I was out pining laundry on the clothesline thinking some of my favorite thoughts. 
how much I hated Lucy for stealing Roland's attention from me and for giving him a son before I did. My delicious jealousy towards her became such second nature to me, I hardly even felt guilty about it anymore. When I realized that I knew things had to change, it wasn't for Roland's sake or for Lucy's sake or even for God's sake, but for my own, that I finally chose not to dwell on my resentment for her a single minute longer. When that dark filter finally fell from my eyes, I discovered a sister wife who was gentle and compassionate and ready to be my friend. She always had been. Wow, y'all, this is something else. Okay, chapter 18. Due to Verlin's hard work, the ranch was now fairly productive. The united order between the LeBaron brothers went by the wayside because none of the others had Verlin's stamina or strong work ethic. In our fields, we grew tomatoes, beans, green chiles, alfalfa, and occasionally even cotton. With our husband's permission, we picked tomatoes and green chiles from his field, and we were allowed to sell a few kilos to our friends and neighbors. For the first time in marriage, I had a little spending money. Since I now had another baby very much on the way, I saved up every cent, determined to buy a crib. Well, it says centavio, but I think that's cent. I took my savings to the mercantile in El Valle and secured, I think I'm saying that wrong, V-A-L-L-E, and secured one on a layaway plan. I chose a bluish crib, hoping for a boy this time. As soon as possible, as soon as I possibly could, I paid off the balance and brought the crib home. In a matter of a few weeks, I also made a down payment on a dresser. Actually getting to purchase the things I need was a new experience. I felt so blessed. Verlin desperately needed my help to get a shipment of, to of tomatoes off to Ciudad. <sighs> The truck would arrive for the shipment in three days, so we had to rush like mad to sort and pack them. While I worked, I sat on a rough wooden crate with nothing to shield me from the hot July sun. My baby was due in a week, and my huge tummy interfered with the strenuous job I was doing. I worked with Verlin and some hired men for 12 to 14 hour days. Long after dark, on the third day, the truck finally left with its full load. That night, I flopped into bed, exhausted, but my aching back made sleep impossible. I turned from side to side with no relief. Then quite oddly, I thought the pain began to come and go. At 1 a.m., it hurt so bad I couldn't take it any longer. Although it wasn't right for me to bother my husband when he was with another wife, unless it was some great emergency, I figured I felt worse than I could ever make Charlotte feel just by intruding on her rights. So I slipped on my shoes and walked the 20 feet over to get Verlin. I knocked tenantsly on her bedroom window. Verlin, I called. What's the matter, he asked groggily. Please come help me. My back is killing me. I've barely gotten back to my house when Verlin and Charlotte came in all excited. Well, sis, sis be thankful, she said. It will soon be over. I'm not in labor, Charlotte. It's only a backache. That's what you think. She put a few dry corn cobs in the stove and poured some coal oil over them to start the fire. Adding a few small chips of wood, she had the water boiling in practically no time. What what do you have to tie the baby's core with? She asked as she started prepping my bed. We'll have to use string out of the flour sack. There's a clean sack in that top drawer, I said. I figured I might as well go along with them in case they know what they were talking about. Charlotte pulled the string free from the sack and handed it to Verlin with orders. Stand back and let's make it stronger. You twist in one direction and I'll twist in another. One thing about Charlotte, when it's time for Charlotte to show up, Charlotte shows up. I like that about Charlotte. I'm going to have to be honest, I do. <sighs> That's enough. Now hand your end to me so we can double it and then we'll do it again. The string wound together perfectly. She placed it in a saucer, pouring alcohol on it. I asked her to get my pillowcase from the closet. It was full of white rags I sterilized in the oven to be used during my delivery. Then I placed a clean set of used baby cloths and a receiving blanket on the chair side of the bed. Feeling rather silly about all these preparations, I voiced my opinion one more time. 
You guys are excited over nothing. I'm sure I've just thrown my back out from all that work packing tomatoes. I ought to know whether I'm in labor or not. With both Leah and Donna, it was just one solid excruciating pain that never let up. No, honey, this is it. Verlin assured me as he rushed out to get his brothers. Oh, is she really going into labor or not? What do y'all think? His brother, Alma, he asked Alma to drive up to Spencerville and bring Aunt Sylvia back as fast as she could. He's really bringing Aunt Sylvia back after he had to take over the way he did last time. I don't think y'all need her. Verlin and Charlotte then did their best to comfort me, taking turns rubbing my back and joking around until the midwife arrived, arrived, arrived at 5 a.m. She proceeded to examine me. I apologize for all the inconvenience, Aunt Sylvia. I don't think I'm really in labor, I said. Oh, yes, you are. You're dilating all right. And this should be all over in a few hours. That sealed it. I was in labor. More immediately, though, I was famished. I've been too tired to eat supper. So while Charlotte went next door to check on her three kids, I sent Verlin to the kitchen to grab me something to eat. He returned with half a cantaloupe with a spoon protruding from its center. Before he could hand it to me, I bore down with a hard labor pain. From his expression, I could tell he thought I was really suffering. He started to put the cantaloupe on the nightstand out of the way, but the pain subsided. So I relaxed and said, it's okay, Verlin, hand it to me. I want to eat a bite before another pain comes. He sat down on the chair next to me and, and I started to eat. When another pain hit, I quickly gave it back to him. Just then, Charlotte walked in with Lucy, whom I was glad to see despite my pain, since I knew she felt bad if we left her out. Seeing Verlin sitting there by me with the cantaloupe in his hands, Charlotte lit into him. I don't believe this. How can you sit there eating while Irene's suffering? You should be ashamed of yourself. She and Lucy wonder why Verlin and I burst out laughing. He handed it back to me, shaking his head. I haven't had a bite, he said to Charlotte. Honestly, it's hers. <laughs> she turned to me. You mean you're actually eating during labor? You know me. I'd have to, to be dead not to eat when I'm hungry. Aunt Sylvia checked me again and shook her head. Considering how hard your pains are, you're still not making much progress. I was getting exasperated. I got off the bed and paced the floor, bending over the dresser for support. I braced myself for each pain. I rubbed my protruding stomach and aching back. Then I breathed deeply and blow air out through my pursed lips. Eventually, the unbearable pains forced me to lay down again. At eight o'clock, Aunt Sylvia motioned for Verlin to follow her outside for a pirate conference. In a few minutes, I heard Alma's truck drive away. Naturally, I got upset wondering what was wrong. What were they keeping from me? When they returned, I demanded angrily, what's going on? Don't worry, Verlin tried calming me. We decided to send for Dr. Ramirez so you won't have to keep suffering. That did it. After what happened with Leah, I wasn't having that man look up at me ever again. Hoping to force my body into a compliance, I jumped off the bed and as I did, my water broke. Verlin and Charlotte helped me back onto the bed. Lucy held the pan of hot Lysol water for her mother to disinfect her hands. When Sylvia was finished, Lucy put the pan down and said, all right, Irene, this is it. With Lucy on one side and Charlotte on the other, I grabbed their hands and bore down while Verlin urged me on. When he saw the baby's head was appearing, he said, come on, Irene, it'll come all out right. That's what I'm afraid of, I yelled back. But in the next moment, the violent pain became too excruciating for joking. I can't, I can't, I screamed. Roland tried to calm me. Irene, you've got to think positive. Hell, what did he know about it? I felt like swatting him. I gritted my teeth, looked right at him and said, I positively think I can't. <laughs> I love her. <laughs> you got to be positive. Well, I positively think I can. <laughs> but I knew it was up to me now. I pushed one more time and then, thank God, it was all over. It's a boy. It's a boy, Verlin exclaimed. He's born on our anniversary. Don't ever say I didn't give you a present. He kissed me gratefully. 
Andre was a darling baby. His reddish blonde hair was adorable. It felt like peach fuzz. As thrilled as Verlin was, he was a bit perturbed when Alma showed up with the doctor. He wished he waited a few more minutes before sending him. Then, like, yeah, yeah, like you keep paying for doctors and don't need the doctors. All the money we had to pay Dr. Ramirez, we could have used to feed the kids. Verlin now had eight children, Charlotte's baby. Mark was born six weeks before Andre and Lucy was pregnant again. That would soon make nine. One morning around 3 a.m., I awoke to Verlin's hired hand, Pancho Ponce, shouting for help. My Spanish still wasn't too good, but I caught enough of what he said to surmise his wife, Susa, was in labor. He kept saying excitedly, pronto, Irene, andale, pronto. In my broken Spanish, I tried to make excuses, explaining I wasn't qualified to deliver his wife's baby. I rushed him over to Lucy, who knew Spanish, so she could tell him I couldn't do it. After they talked a moment, Lucy told me her labor pains were already less than five minutes apart. There was no car available to rush her to Dr. Ramirez. Pancho was right begging me as a friend to please get into his wooden wagon right now and go with him before Susa had the baby all by herself. I grabbed a few clean white rags, some Lysol, and a couple of aspirin. Lucy assured me I could do it and told me not to worry about my two kids because she would tend to them. I dreaded having to leave little Andre because it was almost time for him to wake up and nurse, but Lucy promised to take him over to Charlotte so she could nurse him until I returned. The team of horses raced through the darkness. We could hear Sousa's screams as the wagon approached their one room shack. Pancho wiped the horses hard, whipped the horses harder to make them sprint right up to the door. Then he jumped out and helped me down. Offering a quick prayer, I followed him into the house. Sousa's suffering during delivery was pretty obvious, but nobody would ever know the turmoil I endured. What if something went wrong? Would I be blamed? I kept my composure only because I had to look every bit the part of calm, the knowledgeable midwife Sousa thought I was. I hadn't an incompetent midwife myself, and it was nothing I meant to subject anyone else to, even if it wasn't true of me at the time. Thank God it came out all right for Sousa and me. I was still just 18. This was the first of about a dozen babies I was able to help bring squealing into the world. And that is where we're going to end it, you guys. This is so good. The fact that she's already had, what, three kids and she's 18? Just like it's back to back. These women are not getting any breaks. They just keep having babies. That's a lot. It's a lot to put on a person, a lot financially, a lot emotionally. Your baby, it takes what, a whole year from a woman's body to recover from um pregnancy? Whew, that's a lot. Anyways, let me know what you thought of this chapter. Until next time.